Hi, everybody. Welcome to Homeowner 101, sponsored by Ace Rewards. My name is Lou Manfredini, and I'm Ace's home expert. And what we want to do uh, this evening for the next hour is answer any questions you have as it pertains to living inside your home. You know, whether you need to fix something, repair something, maintain something, maybe improve something. The whole idea is that you can post your questions onto our site. And I've got some lovely assistants off camera here who are going to be reading those questions. And I'm going to do my very best to uh, help you this evening to try and make uh, living in your home a little bit easier tonight. And that's what it's all about, is uh, helping you. So any kinds of questions that you have, uh, we were sort of joking before the cameras rolled that, you know, a lot of you have some pretty funny screen names. And if they're a little too funny, we might not use them. So, uh, you know, we're going to get things started. We have some questions already. So uh, why don't we hear from the audience and see what we have going. Audience, is that what we call them? Are you an audience? Yeah, you're an audience. Sure. All Hello. right, ready? Yes, yeah, so we have a question from Susan in Long Tell Island. Tell the people who you are. I'm, I'm Jake. Jake, right. not from State Farm. <laughs> Susan in Long Island is struggling with some double pane windows that look a little cloudy. What should she do to fix that problem? Okay, so Susan, your, uh, and, uh, your double pane windows, imagine I'm looking at your double pane windows uh, inside the glass. And here's the fogginess right here like this. You more than likely what's happened is the, the, um, uh, the seal's been broken, and it used to be that you had to replace the sashes. And many times, depending on the window, you know, if you've got a, 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 a sash like this, the frame of the window, and then this is the glass inside, the glass itself can be replaced, and the sash can come apart, and you can get a new um, thermal pane glass in there. However... There are, where did we say Susan's from? Long Island, on Long Island? Long right? Island, yes. Okay, I happen to know for a fact that there are some companies in New York on Long Island that take the cloudiness out of your windows. Now, what they end up doing is they come into the sash and they drill a hole and they use a vacuum pump and they suck all the air that's out of there and then they seal it inside. It usually costs about $90 a window to do this. Now, this is the thing that you got to keep in mind. They don't offer like this great warranty for it all, okay? So let's just say you have two or three windows that are a problem, but the rest look okay. Then, then it's probably worth the 90 bucks a window. But if all of a sudden you have a half a dozen or a dozen windows, you may be a better candidate, depending on how long you're going to stay in the house, to actually replace the glass. And then finally, if the rest of the windows aren't in great shape, then you may want to consider doing an entire replacement on the windows themselves. It could either be um, with vinyl windows, fiberglass window, or wood window. It all depends on your budget. I hope that helps. Jake's raising his hand. Yeah, yes? we, have, we have another question from Jordan. We don't know where Jordan is from. All right. Um, what is your opinion on septic tank cleaning? I've owned a home for eight years and have not pumped the tank. I've been told to pump it yearly, and some have, old, some have told her not, him or her, I guess, not to worry about it. Right. So, Jordan, uh, septic tanks typically, you know, there's a couple different uh, uh, systems out there, more than a couple, but you almost inherently have what's called a sludge tank. So, initially, your home drains into a sludge tank. And in a conventional gravity-fed system, when the water comes to a certain level, that's what then goes out into the leach field. That sludge tank does, in fact, need to be pumped out. Many municipalities and, and villages and cities require that to be done either on an annual basis or every three years. It all depends on how many people live in your home. But if you've never had this done, I would highly recommend that you get a licensed pumping contractor to come out. You'll be surprised. It's not that expensive. I'm going to say, you know, it's going to be a couple hundred dollars for them to come out and do this. But this will ensure that you don't get a backup or contaminate the rest of the leach field, which this is one of those things that if you don't do it on a regular basis, could cost you money, um, more money down the line. Hope that's helpful. <laughs> I, well, I wish you could see the camera because he raises his hand. I can not see him out of the corner of my eye, but it's okay. We're new to this. Go ahead, Jake. Another question from Carol. Um, 
she has a stinky garbage disposal and wants to know how to remove that odor. Ooh, I got this is a good one. All right, so here's your sink, right? Here's your disposal hanging down there like this, right? You're going to take a toilet brush, all right, and you're with the switch off, and you're going to shove that down inside the, uh, the disposal, and you're going to take a little pine saw, and you're going to pour it over the top, like a quarter cup of pine saw, not a whole, whole heck of a lot. And then you're going to take that toilet brush and scrub it. All the smell is right here, right underneath that rubber boot right there, and especially the part that goes down that folds in. You got to get that brush underneath there. You will be disgusted as you pull that brush out how dirty it is, but you will be amazed at how much better it smells. Keep them coming. Let's go. We got Jake, we got to pick up the pace. There's a little too much lag time here. I apologize. You're like pausing. I Here's the thing. When I stop speaking, you go. Got it. Got it. Here we we'll go. work on the timing a Come little on. bit. Question from Mavi. Mavi, sorry if I pronounce your name wrong. For framing, do you use nails or screws? For framing, if we're framing like a wall, um, you know, Traditionally, you would use nails, but if it's some a smaller project, the whole idea is that the screws will give you a much better hold um, when you're putting things together. In conventional framing, like framing a house, nails work great. You know, the the old advice I got from a carpenter. I was a a carpenter's apprentice, and that's what the trade was that I I learned. That remember, it's not the nails that hold the wood; it's the wood that holds the nails. But a smaller project, absolutely use screws. Angel in Orlando, how to maintain a mold-free house exterior? Oh, yeah. Um, okay. Regular treatment. There's a terrific product that you can find at Ace called Wet and Forget. This is a, uh, a product that was invented in Australia. You know, New Zealand, they get very, uh, they get very uh, upset about that. The people from New Zealand don't like when you say they're from Australia. It's from New Zealand. And um, this product is an exterior product that you can spray onto the home. It either comes in a concentrated bottle or they now offer one that you can put on the end of a garden hose that will spray up to 30 feet. And the whole idea is it kills all that organic material, in particular on the north side of the house where you don't get a lot of sun. It really does a terrific job. If you've got heavy mildew and mold on the outside now, it may be something that you apply the wet and forget and maybe come back and do a little bit of scrubbing. But once you eliminate it, if you were to do this to your home twice a year, you would have to do no scrubbing whatsoever. If there's not a lot, you'll be amazed at just after 30 days, how much, um, how much faster, or excuse me, how uh, amazing it looks when it's done. 30 days, that's all it'll take. Question from Diane, what ways to keep your house warm in the winter, uh, keeping in mind trying to keep the energy bill down? How about a sweater? Next question. No. Um, okay, a couple things. Um, if you have forced air heating and air conditioning, then it's really important that you keep the furnace filters uh, changed, right? This is something that, especially during the pandemic, indoor air quality is very important. And so I am a big proponent of using pleated filters as opposed to inexpensive um, spun fiberglass filters that you're going to have to change them once a month because it's going to help filter the air. But if you let them get too clogged, the system will run more. Here's another thing. You got to eliminate the drafts inside your home. If you live in a two-story home, I am going to bet you dimes to dollars. If you went upstairs right now, you would find a couple of windows that are not locked. Now, if you lock the windows, it helps bring them back together and seal out the drafts. That's simple. So go check all that. The other thing you can do is take a candle and kind of go around the windows. And if you see a flickering, that means there's a draft there. You can add either some removable caulking. There's one called zip away or zip strip that can go around there that will seal it up. And then in the, in the springtime, you just peel it away almost like string cheese when you're done. You can also use a window film. The drafts are the biggie. And then where the, um, where the trim meets the floor, you may feel a lot of drafts down there. Use some clear caulking that goes on white, but clear. It'll blend in. You won't even see it. You eliminate those drafts with a little bit of weather stripping, better filters on your furnace, and you will warm up the space 
without adding a bunch of money to your energy bills. We have a question from John. How can I get paint to match the colors of my existing walls to cover over patches? Um, so here's the thing. The, um, if you don't have any extra paint left, then we got a color match. And <clears throat> what I would probably say, where you did the patching, take a utility knife, and cut a piece of the paint out of the wall. Maybe like the size of this tape measure. Something big enough that you can then go down to your local ace and ask them to color match it. When you do that, then you're going to patch that hole as well. Keep in mind that if you have a paint with a finish, meaning a eggshell or a satin, something like that, if you just try and patch the area where you did the patching, you're going to see a difference in the sheen. That's a phenomenon in the paint world called flashing. So you may have to paint the entire wall. But if you can take a little chunk of that paint out, go to the ace, they can color match it, and it'll match almost perfectly, you should be good to go. Question from Georgian. She's wondering about on-demand water heaters, and what are your thoughts? I'm a huge fan of on-demand water heaters. Um, I've actually had one in our own home for probably the past eight years, we have uh, four children, and when they were all living at home, six of us, nobody took a cold shower. Because prior to that, it was me taking the cold shower, which I'm not quite sure how that happened. But there's a little bit of a learning curve when it comes to on-demand water heaters, because remember, when it's off, like right now at my house, nobody's probably taking a shower, and that water heater is off. It's not heating any water. Anybody with a tank water heater, no one's taking a shower, but there's 40 or 50 gallons that's being heated waiting for you to turn on the spigot. It actually equates to about 20% of your electric and or gas bill, what they call standby use of a, of a system, just standing by waiting for you to turn it on. Um, the other thing is installation costs. The average 40 to 50 gallon tanked water heater installed by a plumber is anywhere from $1,200 to $2,000. You get into an on-demand water heater, you start at about three, but I'll make one other uh, point about why I like these. The average life of a tank water heater is 10 years. The average life of a on-demand water heater is over 20. So it's about, when you talk about the life of the product, it's about the same amount of money, but you will save so much more money because it's not running when you don't need it. So if you can afford it, I am 100% for it. Deborah from- Hey, Echo. by the way, the timing, much better. I've been working on you it. You are really killing it. I appreciate the positive yeah, feedback. You're right. Deborah from <laughs> Atlanta, Georgia. She's wondering about a preventative maintenance schedule and what are best practices. Well, um, <clears throat> I'm a big preventative maintenance guy. I think that uh, this is money well spent on a bunch of different things. And so if you think about the, the items in your home that are, are the biggest pain points when it comes to uh, things that could go wrong and cost you a lot of money, your heating and cooling system. That should be professionally inspected and cleaned on an annual basis. Typically, that, um, that service calls about anywhere from $100 to maybe $125. And, I mean, you're in Atlanta. It doesn't get super cold. But, you know, the last thing you want to do is have the heat go out in February. And then you got to call somebody, you know, at 2 o'clock in the morning or whatever to come out. It's going to cost you a heck of a lot more. That preventative maintenance will make a, a huge difference. Things like inspecting your roof on an annual basis. Uh, most of us, you know, if you have a garage that's at the front of your house, you may drive into the garage and never go through your front door. You go into the garage, you go into it. You never look at your house from across the street where neighbors are. Go do that and take a look at your roof. Maybe if you have a pair of binoculars, that'd be great as well. To see if you see any missing shingles. See where flashing around the chimney maybe needs to be inspected or looked at because if that is left untreated, it could create a lot more problems for you down the line. Uh, simple maintenance on things like your refrigerator, your hardest working appliance in your home. Think about it, it runs all the time. 
cleaning the coils, which on modern fridges now are at the bottom. You take that kick plate off and use a shop vac and maybe a, a tube brush to clean that out. That can go a long way. I'm also a big fan of using um, enzymes in your plumbing system, meaning um, it's a treatment that you would do the night before. And this could be someone, if you're on a city sewer or even a septic, you flush it down the toilet right before you go to bed so no one's using it. And this enzyme will go inside the pipes and kind of eat up and munch up any of the buildup of the debris and the gunk that can get in there. And, um, and it's a really wise move to do that. I, I think that those types of little things are, are great first steps to make sure that you're maintaining your home preventatively down the line. Oh, wait, one other thing. Uh, draining your water heater. Uh, I get asked this question all the time. If you're going to do this, you got to do it right away. So if you're installing a water heater in the next six months, six months from now, drain the water heater. If you haven't drained that water heater in the last six years, you're not going to get the benefits of, of doing that. Still not a bad idea, but draining your water heater once a year is a very good idea. Cameron, from wait, aren't we going to commercial break now? <laughs> No That's what we need. <laughs> we have all these people. Now we should do Ace is the place, right? We could do a little song. Okay. Why don't you sing it for us, Luke? I will. Uh, we have Cameron from Round Lake Heights, Illinois. The foundation has settled and have some uneven floors. What is the best and most economical way to fix it herself? I mean... <clears throat> If the foundation is settled, then we have a structural issue, which I don't know that I can give you advice on how you would do this yourself. Um, you know, basement waterproofing companies, if you're looking at your foundation, okay, this is the foundation wall, and then at the base of that is something called a footing, okay, and then this is the inside of your house with your basement floor, and then this is the dirt outside. If this is fallen and it's collapsed inside the ground, what will happen is uh, basement waterproofing companies will come in and they'll, they'll put something called a push pier or a helical pier down inside the ground and they'll go all the way to bedrock until they get there. They dig out the side there and they put this metal bra bracket right here and they attach it to this push pier. And then they, they use this as they push it and it lifts up like they crank it up and it lifts this up, then that permanently stays there because this rod is hitting the bedrock. Um, the one thing I will tell you is it's not an inexpensive proposition, but most companies that offer this service will give a transferable warranty. And I will tell you that when you go down, when you go to sell the house someday, any kinds of issues that you have there, it's going to come up in an inspection and it's probably going to end up costing you as a credit when you go to sell, if you get it fixed, then you get the benefits of knowing that your house is on uh, a solid footing and foundation. Anne is asking how to spackle and paint walls and ceilings. How to spackle and paint walls and ceilings. Well, you're going to, uh, you're going to start by any imperfections that are on the walls, uh, you can, depending on if they're smaller, uh, if we're talking about nail holes or small cracks, you can buy at the hardware store some lightweight spackle and a putty knife, and you're just going to go and apply that to areas to fill it all in. It usually takes about 30 minutes. You can come back over with a, um, a sanding sponge to uh, lightly sand it as smooth as you possibly can. Then if you're going to repaint, Again, what I mentioned, if there's some kind of sheen on the walls, you probably can't spot paint it because it's going to flash. You're going to see that where you touch it up is shinier than the rest of the wall. You'll probably be better served if you can go like from one corner of the wall to the other and paint the whole thing. That way you get a nice smooth finish. And if you use a roller, uh, something like a nine inch roller with a three eighths inch nap, the nap is the thickness of the roller itself. You'll, um, you'll get the best finished results for sure. On the topic of a nap roller, Julia is asking about painting a heavily textured ceiling. What nap roller sh would she use? Yeah, so if it's super heavy, uh, Julia, you want to uh, 
use what's called a rough surface roller. It's a big, thick, uh, napped roller. You're probably not old enough to remember the TV show Room 222, but there used to be this guy on the show and he had this big red afro. So if his afro was a paint roller, that's what you're going to use. How about that reference, right? Room 222. Anyone? Love American style? No? Okay, keep going. Uh, Keith wants to know tips on how to maintain a brick home. So brick homes on the outside, which you have to be really careful about, is the tuck pointing. The tuck pointing is probably the single most important thing that you can pay attention to. Um, kind of like my analogy I said earlier about the fact that a nail doesn't hold the wood, the wood holds the nail. The mortar doesn't um, hold the bricks together. The mortar keeps the bricks apart, which is where the strength in the wall comes. And so if you're noticing that um, some of the mortar joints have fallen out, you know, there's gaps, or if you look really closely and you can see hairline cracks between the mortar and the brick, that needs to be tuck pointed. And tuck pointing uh, basically means that they'll come in to do this the right way They'll grind that out at least a half of an inch deep, and then they'll, they'll expose like that groove in between the bricks, and then they'll come back and tuck point it with new mortar. That will give the wall strength. It will help seal out water from getting into the brick, and it will help um, prolong the life of your brick home. Single most important thing you can do is make sure that the tuck pointing and the flashing, that's very important as well, because if the flashing is not in good shape, that will affect the tuck pointing. We'll make sure that your brick home lasts for a very, very long time. Diane is asking about spiders and how to tips to keep them out of the house. I love spiders. The spiders eat all the bugs. Next question. No. So there is, remember that company I told you about, Wet and Forget? They have a product called Miss Muffet's Revenge. And it is a spray a spider spray that you can use both indoors and out, and it works amazingly well. If you apply that once a month, you should, I'm not going to say eliminate your spiders, but you will definitely lower the population. Sarah is asking about her bathroom counter and how to tell if it's marble or granite. She believes it's marble, and if so, does she need to seal it? She's noticing she's getting some darker sections. Well, I mean, I, 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 there's so many different natural stones out there. Marble is very soft. So I'll tell you what, if you wanted to try and see if it was marble, if you can get under the counter, in other words, you know where the, um, maybe there's an overhang, like, can you see this with the camera? Can you see that? There's an overhang right here. Okay. No, not really. Here, come here. Can you see it now? Here. Under this, under this lip. Right, look down here with that camera. Under this lip right here, the countertop's right there. Take a screwdriver and see if you can scratch it. Not with a, like a ton of pressure, but if you can just take a screwdriver and kind of just scratch it a little bit like this and dig in, then more than likely it's marble because you won't be able to do that with granite. Marble is a super soft stone. You absolutely have to seal it. Other, You can either seal it with... Um, um, uh, a specific sealer for marble or stone. Well, no, that you do have to seal it, but you have to do it with granite as well. That's my point. Um, at Ace, you'll find a bunch of different sealers out there. I really like the product uh, from Granite Gold. Clean the countertop really well, spray the sealer over the top of it, and then take a microfiber towel and wipe it away, and then stay off of it for like an hour, and that will seal it. But remember, marble is very soft. And you have to be very careful in a bathroom if you have uh, soaps and lotions and hairspray, things like that can etch the surface. And if you have some staining, if you notice that there's some staining before you seal it, there is something called marble poultice, which is a powder that you, um, you mix with water, like a clay, then you put it over the top of the stain, you cover it with some saran wrap, tape it with painter's tape. Poke some holes in it with a toothpick and let it sit there for 24 hours. After that, it will wick the stain out. You'll take it off. It'll be a wet stain. Once that dries, seal it with the granite gold sealer. 
Joe wants a tankless water heater, and he wants to know what does it entail. Hi, Joe. You're going to love the tankless water heater. I was talking about that earlier. Um, so this is what it entails, typically. Um, if you're going to use a gas system, you have to make sure that you have the right size gas meter to feed the size of the tankless water heater that you want. Um, it's not unrealistic that because uh, on-demand water heaters, give an example, a tanked water heater uses anywhere from 35,000 to 60,000 BTUs to heat the water. An on-demand water heater usually uses like 85,000 to 99,000. So it's almost as big as a furnace. So you just got to make sure that the gas supply coming in there is large enough. And even what you feed from the gas meter, the, you may have to increase the size of the gas line. As far as what else you need, most of them are high efficiency. So you're going to need plastic piping for both an intake and an exhaust, just like a furnace. Depending on where you live, some cities and villages and municipalities allow you, if it's a gas unit, to use the combustion air inside the space. If you live in Florida, a lot of people have them hanging outside on the outside of the house. The same as in California, they're on the outside. You can also go with electric units, which are really nice too. Then you don't need any gas. You just need the proper sizing in your um, electrical box to uh, feed the system. But they're great. I love them. Molly from Kansas City is in the market for a new home. And she wants to know... Go Chiefs! <laughs> She wants to know a checklist to evaluate when looking to buy, um, <clears throat> trying to save herself from some costly repairs. Okay. Molly, Molly, let, let me give you some advice. <clears throat> so there's a bunch of intangibles when it comes to buying a house. A, you got to love the neighborhood and where it's located, and it's got to have the right number of bedrooms and bathrooms and all that kind of stuff. But then there's little things that I want you to look for that will be the differential differentiator between whether you buy this house or not or fall in love with the house for the right reason. Years ago, I was a home builder, and I had a good friend of mine who was looking to buy a house. And they, I was building a house in, in the, uh, a city, and they were looking to buy in the suburbs. They wanted to come by and take a look at this house so I could give them some advice. And I walked him through the house and I said, look for things like what kind of flooring are they using? Is it hardwood floor? Is it carpeting? Uh, are they, is there any crown molding in the house, which is really nice? And, and then I finally I said, the other thing too, is when you walk through, knock on the door like this, the interior doors, are they hollow core doors or are they solid core doors? Now a solid core door is just a better door. It feels better when you open and close it. It's just a better built home. They went to all these open houses and after uh, seeing, I think, eight or nine different homes, called me on Monday morning and said, we want to buy your house that you're building. And I go, well, you're not looking in the city. And he goes, I couldn't get past the darn hollow core doors. And so what you don't know, you don't know until you get into it. Look at the quality of the finishes. I've always said that a really well-built house isn't about how it looks, but how it feels. So pay attention to how the front door opens and closes. How does that feel? The banister going up and down the stairs, if you're looking at a home that has two floors, and the thickness of the doors inside the home, that will tell you a lot about whether or not it's a good house or not. Question from Cindy. How would you fix a back door air leak? It seems to be leaking from the bottom. My sister's name was Cindy. Hi, Cindy. Um, so if it's leaking from the bottom, it's probably a threshold thing. Cindy, open up that door and look down at the part that the door closes onto. If you see a series of circles or screws that are down there, there's a good chance that that threshold is adjustable. So imagine I got the door open and I'm looking down at the window at the door sill like this. Here's the door, okay, it's opened, right? There's the knob, and this is the sill. If you see some circles, typically four or five of them like that, 
Maybe there's plastic caps on them. You can pop those off with a utility knife, and then you're probably going to see Phillips head screws right there. Okay. If you loosen those screws, now I'm looking at the side like this. This little part that goes underneath the door goes up and down, and it will kiss the bottom of the door where there's weather stripping so that it doesn't leak. Now, if it doesn't have that, you can buy what's called a door sweep on the inside of the door that you can either screw onto the inside of the door or use double-sided tape. At Ace, we sell a brand called MD. M is in Mary, D is in dog, stands for Mecklenburg Duncan, and you can put that at the bottom of the door and it'll stick right to it. I know you're amazed, right? Just throwing out all these lingos. You know, I know my stuff. Come on, Jake. Question from Cynthia. She has a bit of a situation. Inside wood trim around upstairs windows have been separated a bit from the wall towards the top. I have triple, pan, triple pan windows and think it may be due to the house settling. What should I do? See, this is where I need the follow-up question. Say it again. This, where's the trim separated? Towards the top. Okay. What's her name? Cynthia. Cynthia. Two Cynthias. Um, <clears throat> if the trim is separated from the window, meaning that it's pulled away, like I'm going to assume that what you're saying is with the window here, if this is the trim, like this is where the gap is. Oh, look at that. Right? I can put it up there like that. Just take a block of wood like this. and a hammer like this, put that right there and just lightly tap it back in and see if that goes in there. It might not be settling, it just might be separation. Question from Chris. He had a grease fire, caused some paint to boil. Tips on how to repair that. Ooh, hopefully everybody's okay. Um, scrape what you can. Sand it all down. Uh, the issue there is that the grease is probably absorbed into the film of the paint. And so once you sand it, you probably will need to wash it too with something as simple as dish soap uh, and warm water so that we can cut all the grease down. Sand it again, dry it. Then I would spot prime. Um, Rust-Oleum makes a odor killing primer, which would be a really good thing to use on that level. Do any kind of patching you need to accomplish as well, and then repaint the surface with a, a finished paint over the top. If you've got uh, the Ace in your area, if they got a Benjamin, if they're Benjamin Moore dealers, that's a really good paint to use on the walls, uh, as well as uh, our Clark and Kensington paint that we sell would be, do a really nice job too. Donna from Wisconsin wants to know, can I have a garbage disposal in a house that has a septic tank? Donna, I cannot say go Packers, but congratulations. Um, you can have a disposal with a house with a, a septic. Um, it, <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of disposals in general, uh, just because I think they're bad for the pipes. Remember that your septic system, it's not a stomach. So it's not like you can throw all that kind of stuff down there. If you are diligent about using a disposal as it's designed, I'm fine with that. My biggest problem with disposals is everybody uses them as a garbage can. You know, if you're peeling potatoes or, you know, or, or peeling the skin off of carrots into the sink, that's fine. But then scoop all that up and put it in the garbage. If there's a couple bits and pieces that end up going down the disposal, Okay, that's fine. But then you also have to be diligent about that sludge tank that we talked about earlier uh, when we started this evening, that you have to get that pumped on a regular basis. So while I'm personally not a huge fan, if you're using it the right way, you absolutely can, uh, can have a disposal. Lisa from Milwaukee, uh, when I look at the hose connected to my humidifier that is attached to my furnace, I don't see any water. Should I see some water in the hose to ensure that water is getting through the filter? 
I'm assuming you mean the drain hose. And sometimes it's very difficult to uh, see that water just because the hose can get a little cloudy. One little trick I have is that when it's running and you want to make sure that you're, well, let me, you know, there should be an adjustment on the humidifier somewhere. Make sure that it's up. Uh, where did she say she's in Milwaukee? So, you know, with the weather in Milwaukee right now, set it to like 35% so that we're sure that the solenoid is kicking it on. Take a pair of pliers and squeeze that hose when the furnace is running. If all of a sudden you see water start to build up, undo the pliers and go. If there's no water, there could be a clogged water line. The adjustment on the uh, humidistat could be faulty as well. And you may need a HVAC contractor to come out and do a little service check. Luke from Chicago wants to know how often he should replace his furnace filters. Luke from Chicago. So furnace filters are should be replaced as needed, and it all depends on the dust and dirt and debris that's in your home. I mentioned earlier this evening that I'm a big fan of pleated filters. Get the right size. Uh, look, if you go to Ace, you can find good, better, best filters. Our Ace branded filters cost about 5 to $7, and they're 10 times better than the 99-cent spun fiberglass ones. We're, almost, we're in the middle of January. Throw one of those in there. Take a look at the color. It's going to be pretty white, you know, kind of an off-white color. Then a month from now, put a thing on your phone to go check the filter in a month. And if you see that it's gray or brown, pull it out and throw another one in there. I mean, if you buy half a dozen filters and just leave them in your mechanical room or your basement, it's like two seconds to get in and out. Stop, you know, looking at the Ace YouTube channel and go change your filter. Oh, no, not, I shouldn't say that. Keep looking at the YouTube channel and then go change your filter. Lynn, again from Chicago, what damage will years of hard water that has not been softened do, do to appliances and home fixtures? So you have hard water with no softener. Um, I mean, it will clog it. It can uh, change the. It can change the uh, finish. You know that can come off on there. You can start to see residue around fixtures on countertops. Hard water can be super destructive, even in things like your dishwasher. So if it's possible to get a softener. I highly recommend it because it will make a huge difference. On the topic, Mike from Lake in the Hills is a new homeowner, wants to install a water softener. Um, I have hard water. What can I do to help the water? Yeah. Uh, congratulations on your new home. Um, water softeners, it, it isn't the type of thing, as a new homeowner, I don't know what your skill level is. In order to do a water softener, you got to come off the main water line of the house so that you're softening everything that goes to the rest of the fixtures. Uh, many times it'll be set up where the garden hoses maybe aren't softened, but it would be something that you probably would get a professional to do. Certainly uh, one of the, the bigger names is Culligan. They've been around for a very long time. They make systems that uh, do a really nice job. There's another company called Kinetico which uh, is a little bit more expensive, but it's what they, it works on uh, uh, the, the kinetics. Like it, it's based on your usage. So uh, they claim that you use less salt in the system, but it will make a huge difference in the feel of the water and uh, improve the uh, longevity of the appliances that you have inside the home. We have DTC Swim, one of your fun names. How do I rehang a towel bar in the bathroom when the holes in the drywall have been expanded? So, <clears throat> if you can't, um, if you can't, uh, well, you have a couple ways to do this. Here's your towel bar, right? The bracket for the towel bar. And here's the bar coming across. And now the holes are all messed up and that's where it needs to go. You could cut out a large piece of drywall and you could put wood behind it and then patch the drywall and do whatever. Or 
You could get a block of wood like this, okay? Mount the bar to the piece of wood. Stay with me. Somewhere in here is a stud because right now you're in the drywall here. So if let's say this is where this went into the drywall and it's not nothing there to grab onto, but behind the wall, here's the stud here. Well, with the block of wood there, now I can put a screw here and I can put a screw here. And now it's super solid because it's against the framing of the wall. And another trick is before you do all that, paint the block of wood the same color as the wall. It'll almost disappear. We have Carrie from Michigan. Is there a way to repair a concrete garage floor other than epoxy? Um, sure. There are top coats that you can use if we're talking about if we're talking about the fact that the concrete is spalling, you know, where it's like got these chips in it and it doesn't uh, you know, even, you know, if you look down at this floor, although this floor is painted, you can paint it and then it'll be one color. Uh, Ace actually makes a terrific uh, uh, concrete paint that you could do on there. Also, Sacrete makes a top coat that is a thin layer of concrete that's like an, it's not an epoxy, it's a concrete, but it's, it's fortified with acrylic, so it sticks to the concrete itself. You'll end up with a concrete finish, and it'll look really nice. This is the only thing. You live in Michigan, so you have winter and road salt and that kind of stuff. Using the, the concrete patch, you know, if you live in Arizona, go for it. You know, the weather is fantastic uh, or warmer climates. So I would be more inclined to maybe have you do a little lightweight patch, concrete patch in the bigger areas where there's problems, and then just paint it all with a floor and porch paint. John wants to know, can you spray wet and forget on a roof to prevent algae? You absolutely can spray wet and forget on a roof. Um, I don't know where you live, John, but uh, if, you, if the weather's colder, meaning you know below 50 degrees, you can't do it now. But if you live in a climate that's warmer, they make one on a hose end that'll spray up to 30 feet, and it'll do a really nice job. We have Rikoshi from Morris. Um, problem with mice, any tips to prevent them from getting into their home? Yes. Here's the thing. There's no such thing as one mouse. So if you've seen one, they have some friends. Um, you have a bunch of options when it comes to mice. I'm going to give you the repellent option because if you're going to bait them or trap them, that's your decision. I'm not going to. We have solutions for that as well. What you want to do is in the, inside the home, under the sink, if you have a basement, I want you to use a repellent. Bonide makes a product called Mouse Magic, which is this repellent that actually smells quite nice to you and I. But for some reason, mice and rats don't like it. And I want you to use that inside the house and then really pay attention on the outside about any cracks or holes or separation where a mouse could get in. Remember that a mouse can fit through a hole the size of a dime. And if you choose to use bait, then I would bait on the outside to draw the mouse out to feed. And if you find an area, so let's say you're, let's say you got a, you know, you've got a, uh, this is the side of your house with siding, right? And the foundation is here and you see like some separation right there or a hole. Put some bait on the outside, the repellent on the inside. Stuff a little newspaper loosely into the hole. Tomorrow, go there, and you're going to see that the newspaper is not in the hole anymore. Hopefully, they ate some of the bait. Put the newspaper back in, and then when the newspaper no longer falls out of the hole, there's a good chance that the mouse is gone, metaphorically and not so metaphorically. And... Uh, then you can patch that hole, make sure they're not coming back in. Question from Marion. How to seal gaps between a wooden floor and baseboards to keep the, old, the cold air out? Use a clear acrylic caulking. If you buy a tube of that caulking, it goes on white so that you can see what you're doing. But as it dries, it turns clear. And once it turns clear, you won't even know that it's there. 
and that will seal out the draft. I'm telling you, a couple of tubes of caulk, we're talking about a, a 6 or $7 investment here, will make a world of difference in how comfortable you feel inside your home. Lee is asking, what is your favorite two-by-four project? What's my favorite two-by-four? Looking for something a little bit more fun here. Hmm. Well, I have a daughter who's in I have a daughter who's in college, and um, she is in her senior year. She's twenty one, and for Christmas she wanted me to build her a bar, and so I built her a bar, and I made it out of two by fours and pallets. That was pretty fun. Um, we have Denise has some foggy glass. Um, what about hurricane glass in Florida? Foggy glass. Um, okay. So, I mean, hurricane glass, a lot of that is mandated by, you know, municipalities, depending on where you live to have that. Uh, the fogginess, I guess, I don't understand. If you're talking about in between the panes of your glass where it's foggy, I mentioned earlier that there are uh, services out there that will come and remove that fog from the glass. Typically, it's about $90 a, um, a sash to do that, but that's not going to add hurricane glass if that's what you want. It sounds like there's two different things there, but if you have fog between two panes of glass, these services, if you look up or Google, you know, uh, fog removing from thermal pane uh, windows, you should be able to find contractors in your area to come out and do that work. Sarah from Chicago is looking for any tips or must do's of trying to install a new toilet. Is it a pretty easy job or? It's a great way to throw out your back. So be very careful. If you've never installed a toilet before, um, you have to be very careful about this. It, it's a simple job. You just have to understand the anatomy of the whole thing, right? So the, uh, the floor of your bathroom, I'm looking at it sideways. There's a, a, a round thing that comes down here, and that's called a toilet flange that the toilet sits on top. And there's those two bolts that stick up. You know, when you look at the toilet, those are called Johnny bolts. So you've got the toilet here, right, that, that kind of comes like this. Not a bad toilet. And you got the water line right here. You need to turn that water line off. You need to uh, take this water line off of the toilet itself, and you need to have a little bucket here to catch any water that's going to come out of there. You're going to flush the toilet a couple times, remove as much water as you can from the bowl, and then re remove those two Johnny bolts, and you're going to pull that entire unit out. This is where you throw your back out, so you're going to need some help. There's a wax ring that seals the toilet to this, and you're going to have to scrape all that out and clean it out. I would highly recommend you get new Johnny bolts, you get a new wax ring, um, and then you also get a brand new toilet. And depending on if you're going to do that, I would highly recommend what's called a comfort height toilet, which is a little bit taller as opposed to getting so far down. It's just easier to use. And when you go to put the new toilet in, the trick there is you put the Johnny bolts in, you put the wax ring on the bottom of the toilet. Without the tank on, if it's a two-piece toilet, because it's easier to maneuver, and you kind of line it up and you put it on there and you kind of squish it in place and you make sure that it's sitting there flush to the ground, not moving around, then you tighten those Johnny bolts up, then you put the tank on and connect all of that. Do we have a, a ACE video on our YouTube channel on how to install a toilet? Are you a mute? You can't speak? You know... There's a person you're not seeing on camera, Allison, who is the brains behind all of this. And normally the woman talks like crazy. She hasn't said a word tonight. It's amazing. And it's because she's wearing a mask. Anyway, we have a video on our YouTube channel on how to install a toilet. And, and you can see the, the how-to. And we sell toilets at Ace. You can get a really good uh, uh, deal on a toilet there, along with all the other parts and pieces that you need to make it sink. A uh, question from Kyle. Uh, he's uh, also a new homeowner. Wait, was this jazz hands? You want me to do jazz hands? Okay, keep going. 
Kyle? Kyle, our new homeowner, has a partially finished basement. Um, it looks like he has some worry that there might be some hidden water in the basement. Any Ooh. signs or things to look out for? Uh, well, Kyle, congratulations on your new house. Uh, you, this is what stuff you're going to discover. If you're talking about hidden water, meaning that maybe you think it's behind a wall or something like that, we need to find out what's going on there because the last thing you want to do is have a mildew and mold issue down the line. So, you know, if you're suspicious of it, then let's really pay attention to what's going on because that can lead to much bigger problems. Now, did Kyle say where he lives? No. Okay. Depending on where you live, many states, you know, if they sold you this house and knew there was water there, that's a huge no-no. There's a disclosure that they had to put out when you sold you the house. And if they had knowledge that there was water there and you can prove that this is a, a problem that's been going on for years, not that I'm a big litigious guy, but you can go back to the seller and say, hey, what the heck's going on here? Now I got to spend X amount of dollars to fix this. You kind of tried to pull the wool over my eyes and I don't like that. Kyle? Ken is asking, uh, best way to clean hardwood floors? Um, I have been a proponent and a user of a product called Bona Chemi Hardwood Floor, floor Cleaner. Uh, B-O-N-A. K-E-M-I. They are a, a company that actually makes one of the best floor finishes that's used professionally. They created a really good neutral base cleaner along with a microfiber um, mop that they have one you can integrate into a bottle of a sprayer. A lot of Ace stores carry the bonus system. It really is a terrific way to maintain the luster on your floor, not dull the finish, and keep them clean. Kate is asking, uh, her sump pump runs constantly in the spring and fall. She has a lot of standing water in her yard. Any thoughts or suggestions? Well, um, so here's the thing with a sump pump. You know, the, uh, if this is your floor and this is your pit, right, and you've got pipes coming in from the drain tile and you said you get a lot of standing water in there, if your pump is sitting down here on the bottom of the pit, and then the pipe comes up here, you know, and you get to check valve, and then there it goes, okay? Depending on where the switch is for the float, if your float is connected to the pump like this, you may want to raise this pump up a little bit so that it doesn't run that often. The way you can test this is, you know, you got a cord plugged into the wall. On a day, like, did, did you say it was Kate? Do we know where Kate lives? No? That'd be helpful, people. Um, so when we do this again, we got to ask people to tell us, because that way I can kind of visualize what's going on. But we're learning. It's our first time with this. Are, are we still jazz hands? Okay. Um, unplug the pump and then see where the water goes. Remember, water seeks its own level. So if, if, this, if you unplug the pump and the water is like a good 12 inches, you know, 12 to 14 inches below the top of the floor, right, or where the floor meets, then let's either adjust the float or the pump to come up so the pit holds more water. I don't care if it holds more water. It doesn't matter. Then when more water gets in there, then it activates and it pumps it away. That way it won't run as often. Now, the other thing you got to figure out is if your yard is holding a lot of water, why is that? Is it all the neighbors dumping into you? Is there some culvert that's clogged or something? I would address that potentially with a really good landscape contractor to come out there and take a look at it to see if they can help solve that by re, uh, you know, um, grading the backyard so that we can push some of that water away. That with an adjustment with the pump should help it not run as often. Question from Sarah. She wants to know, how can I tell if, she, if my water is hard or soft? A water quality test. Uh, at Ace, we sell these do-it-yourself kits. They cost about $10. And it's a lot like if you, anybody that owns a pool and you use those test strips, you know, to see what the chlorine level and stuff is inside there, you'll put it in a cup of water. It'll tell you the hardness of the water. And then you can, uh, from there, decide if you want to go down the next route of softening the water with potentially installing a softener or, you know, some other 
uh, fixes that are out there to help you. Next question is from Rockin' Robin. We have a water heater in our home. Uh, hasn't been ma maintained in the last 10 years. What should she do at this point? Well, I mean, you could try draining it, but as I mentioned earlier, you're not going to get a huge benefit out of it. The one thing I will tell you is this. The average life of a tank water heater is 10 years old. If you're not sure exactly how old your water heater is, when you look at the, uh, you know, this is your tank water heater and somewhere you got a sticker on there with the serial number, the first two letters on the serial number are the year it was manufactured. So it says 05, 06, whatever it is. If it's more than 10 years old, start planning to replace it. You will, you, it will cost you less money to replace it on your terms as opposed to on a Wednesday morning, you wake up and you don't have hot water and then you got to call a plumber in an emergency and it's going to cost you even more. So better to do it now because the average life, 10 years. Question from Sam. She's in Michigan. How can I find a stud in a wall without using a stud finder? Um, take a look at your, uh, your wall. Okay. Imagine those are the studs right there. That is your outlet. That outlet is mounted to a stud. So now it's either mounted on that side of the stud or on that side of the stud. And go and figure out if you put a nail in there, that's where it's at. You found that stud, take a tape measure from the center and go 16 inches. Typically wall studs are every 16 inches. You just found the stud without a stud finder. Uh, David, from, also from Michigan, what is your best technique for removing soap scum buildup from a glass shower wall? Oh. At your local Ace, ask them if they have a product called Bright and Clean. B R I T E and Clean. It's a powder. You're going to take a, a microfiber towel like this, going to get it wet in warm water. You're going to sprinkle the powder on top of this microfiber, and you're going to go and wipe it on either the walls or the glass. Get ready to be amazed. What? What's that? Wrap it up? It's like this. She's like, sachet. Okay. Thanks for joining us in our, our one hour of Homeowner 101. I hope you'll consider becoming an ACE Rewards member because when you do, you get all kinds of benefits. You save money, you get all kinds of special programs, and ACE Rewards is who brought us this event tonight. Remember that at ACE, we are a bunch of locally owned hardware stores all across the United States and in a bunch of other countries too, but we're right here to help you every single day. So if you ever need any help, when it comes to maintaining your home, stop by your local Ace Hardware store. I promise you, you'll find someone there that can help you along the way. Because remember, Ace is the helpful place. Have a good night, everybody.